Last week, we focused on the context for Paul writing this letter to Timothy. And some of you saw the map I drew last time. We speculated because it is not known with clarity whether or not Paul made a fourth missionary journey. We can piece things together. At the end of Acts chapter 28, it's the third missionary journey, Paul is in prison. We know that he was released from prison, and then he was re-arrested, and he got beheaded after that. So all we have in the writings of Luke is up to the point where he is in prison. But we also talk about the fact that he wrote four letters from prison. Epistles, <coughs> Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. He also wrote a letter to a guy who lived in Colossae called Philemon. We were reconstructing, if I can use a modern phrase, reconstructing Paul's fourth missionary journey. Which early church fathers and early church writers so we map it out this way. So you'll see it's one of the maps showing you one possible route for that. But we know that he started in Rome. And he had intended to go to Spain. So one of the maps I passed out has him going on to Spain. And then what I speculated last week is that he came back down to Crete. And I said, he told Titus, I need you to work on the problems here with the church in Crete. So he dropped off Titus. That was my speculation. Then he went up to Ephesus. And he told Timothy... I need you to work on the problems here in Ephesus. So he dropped off Timothy, and then he went on to Macedonia. And then he wrote letters to Titus and Timothy saying, okay, the problems that you're dealing with, here are serious problems, and I want you to give it your full attention. I probably speculated more than that, but I was having a field day because you weren't here. And no one in the class stopped me, so I felt... <laughs> I wasn't here commissioned. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of the game plan for today. I was thinking of photocopying my board plan. Here is what I had planned. Nerds in the first century church. And my game plan included errors in the modern church. The third part of my plan was disciplines to make us good disciples. So, as I said, in my mind I always have a vision of what I want to be on the board. Because people come in at different times, and I want to, for them to look at the board, and for it to tell them, okay, here's what's been said so far. So I was going to focus, start in, with the errors in the first century church. And I was going to talk about a few of the churches. The first letter, one of the first letters that Paul wrote, is the letter to the churches in Galatia. Okay? If you have a map, Galatia is Turkey, eastern part of modern Turkey. So Galatia would be like a province, and there are many cities in Galatia. I will tell you that I think Timothy was from that area. Okay, it was Derby and Lystra, and Timothy was from Lystra. When Paul did his, Paul made his first missionary journey, it was confined to an area close enough to Israel. It didn't go past that part of eastern Turkey. The second missionary journey went over to Greece. The third missionary journey also went over to Greece. Then he went to Rome. And the fourth missionary journey, I think, starts from Rome. So that's a little bit of the background. It's instructed that Timothy is from the Galatian area because when Paul is strategizing, if I can use a made-up word, about who to send where, now it is true that he sent these people to different places. So Paul would be like the territorial commander in the Salvation Army. And he is appointing divisional commanders, and Timothy is a divisional commander in Ephesus. And Titus is a divisional commander in Crete. I could say a pastor, but I want to say that there were several congregations in the area, and therefore there was oversight responsibilities. The first letter he wrote was to the church in Galatia. The church is in Galatia. And the error was Judaizers teaching obedience to Jewish law. My favorite verse in the letter to the Galatians is chapter 3, verse 1. King James Version. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? <laughs> but in chapter 2, he talks about the error that was being promulgated on the people. This heresy. He says in chapter 2, Who has come to teach you a different gospel? In other words, these people are coming to pull you back into Judaism, but you are not Jews, you're Gentiles, and there's a freedom that we have. 
He gets as bold as to criticize Peter. And he calls Peter a hypocrite. He says he's been a hypocrite because he knows that you are under a different dispensation. And he will eat with you when others aren't around. And when they come, he acts so He lets the Jews influence him. But isn't that hypocritical? If you accept the Gentiles and the Jews are not around, don't let them, their presence cause you to back off from them. You're being a hypocrite. I focus on that because in today's passage, he talks about hypocritical liars. I mean, that's like a left and a right, double punch. Not only are you a hypocrite, but you're a liar. So Paul has a mouth and a temper, and he will speak and tell you exactly what he thinks, even if you're Peter. In front of the head of the church, James, and Jude and the other people who are close in that inner circle, he confronts Peter and says, you're a hypocrite. And I think Peter says, thank you, brother, I needed that reprimand. <laughs> so when he calls individuals hypocritical liars in the passage we're focused on today, he's accustomed to speaking like this. Hypocritical liar is unsaid, a little harsh. But if he calls Peter a hypocrite, then it's another step. So be careful what you say. The Galatian heresy is that the Judaizers were coming after Paul and saying, look, you guys need to do it the Jewish way. Let's move on to, and I don't have a lot of evidence here, so I'm going to go to when he's in prison, and he writes to the Colossians. And you probably know by now that Colossians is my favorite Pauline letter. And the heresy is multiplied because not only is there Judaizers, but there's also Gnosticism. Let me summarize the main idea in Gnosticism. And some of you might have a different perspective in your Bible commentaries, but I put it a little differently. But here is how I understand Gnosticism. The one true God did not create the earth. The earth, creation was done by a demigod. The one true God is spirit. And the demigod who created the material world went against God's intentions. And God had to send Jesus to undo what this demigod had done. And therefore, it said what is in each of us is a spark, a divine spark that wants to be reunited with God. And that's what, why Jesus came. And in order for you to get reunited with God, you have to listen to those who have this knowledge. Jesus chose some disciples, brought them into his inner circle, and gave them this, I want to say, secret knowledge, this special knowledge. So if you listen to one of the disciples, then you get this special knowledge. So part of Gnosticism is there's a special knowledge that you have to get. And that's the path back to the one true God. That's how I understand the main essence of the Gnostics' teaching. Special knowledge. The Greek word is knowledge. Secret or special knowledge that you have to get. And the path to get it is to sit at the feet of one of the original disciples, apostles. And that puts Paul on the outside because he's not one of those chosen. So you can see how they can come against Paul. Well, he is, he claims to be an apostle, but he is not one of those who has a special knowledge of it. There are other understandings of Gnosticism, and I'm sure that it developed way beyond that, and it was bigger in the second century. I'm talking about first century, so clearly it's now at the origins. But it was said to originate in Alexandria, which is in Egypt, amongst Jews. So it started out in Judaism, and it spilled over into Christianity. Kind of like you're mixing two different things together, an admixture. But that's the error. The two errors there are Judaizers Judaizing the Colossian congregations and Gnosticism. I should tell you that both Galatia and Colossae are in the Turkey area, as is Ephesus. Corinth, Thessalonica, Berea, Philippi, those are in the Greek area. None of these are included in the heresy, so it was Jews who had spread into what we call the, the diaspora, but not into Greece, who were telling these converts, you know what, we have the book, and here's what the book says, and there's these 600 plus laws, and if you do this, and you follow these works. Another part of the error I should have mentioned was meats, and drinks, and Sabbaths, and holy days. Things like that. Guess where these are coming out of? The old covenant. The old covenant. So if you follow these things, so in, in Colossians chapter 2, the entire chapter 2, he's talking about all of these issues. But then he says, plus, there's a special knowledge. So if you read Colossians 2, you'll see what the name heresies were. I'm going to move on and talk about Peter and John. 
And I'm going to focus on the epistles, and in particular, 2 Peter chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 1. 2 Peter is written at the end of Peter's life. So like Paul, who was in prison in Rome, writing to the Colossians around 60-something AD, Peter was also, at the end of his life, allegedly in Rome, writing to these Gentiles in the Turkey area. The second epistle is allegedly to the scattered, but is mostly to the churches in Galatia, according to Bible scholars. The same location where earlier in his life, he was separating from these guys when the Jews came around and got labeled by Paul as a hypocrite. He is now writing to them, there is error going on. The same error that he was a part of, many years later he is saying, this is error. And you need to separate yourself from it. So Paul has come around, closer to the end of his life, acknowledging that there's a lot that's going wrong. And you can't stand on one side on the fence. You have to get in the game and say, okay, this is error. It needs to be cleaned up. John, the beloved disciple, apostle, also around the end of his lifetime, maybe a few years earlier, is writing about heresies as well. So we have Peter, John, and Paul all writing about heresies. Two particular churches where the heresies are directly addressed, but also because 1 Timothy is written to Timothy when he was in Ephesus as the divisional commander, slash bishop, whatever you want to call it. We know that there are serious problems in the Ephesian church. The Gnosticism. We know that in Ephesus, the temple to Diana, or Artemis, is there. We know that they worship many gods, and we skipped on the leadership role of women in chapter 2. I'm glad I wasn't the teacher then. But a large part of the conversation talks about the fact that because religion around the temple of Diana was done by women, the women were the priestesses, and there was a prostitution priestess situation. This is why Paul writes and says the women should adore themselves. We're bred here because that's how the prostitutes were adorned, and they said, you don't want to look like one of those. Of course, there's the other part where he said, and I suffer women not to lead, partly because the women were the priestesses in the religion that was native to those people. I think Paul was speaking personally to say it's best if people don't get the sense that I was a priestess in this thing. I can come into Christianity and be a priestess. So that's part of the reason he made that separation. So that's the background context, continuing from last week. Errors in the church. And I said, with the map, we had Crete down here and Ephesus there. He dropped off two of his special guys who he knew could handle the situation. Titus, by the way, was very expert at solving problems. Titus had been with Paul for many, many years on the missionary journeys. Titus was a Greek. And Paul did not submit to the guys back in Jerusalem over the circumcision issue with Titus. He said, no, we're not going to do that. But he did submit with Timothy, and that's another story for another time. Suffice it to say that Timothy is viewed as not as confident as Titus. And that's why Paul writes and says, don't let them intimidate you because you're young. Don't let them intimidate you. Get in there and challenge them and criticize them and tell them they're wrong and take over and fix this problem. Titus would have gotten it done more effectively. Titus is said to have been very savvy about situations. Timothy. But Timothy grew up with a Jewish mother and a Greek, a Gentile father. Titus is fully Greek. Different culture. When Paul is choosing who to send where, he sends Titus mainly to the Greek congregations in Corinth, etc., to clean up situations. Because you, know, you understand the culture. And he sends Timothy back to an area where he thinks Timothy will understand this culture better. But that's just me speculating a little bit as to how this thing worked out. Good teaching. Let's get back to today's session. Good teaching. False teachers in the church at Ephesus taught dangerous ideas about becoming more spiritual. These false teachers were forbidden marriage and telling believers to abstain from certain foods. The prohibition against marriage came from an early form of Gnosticism that believed that the spirit was good, but anything done for physical pleasure was evil. The idea of abstinence from certain foods likely came from Jewish laws observing special diets, 
but the Gentiles did not. Paul asked Timothy to condemn both of these teachings. <clears throat> Paul also reminded Timothy that spiritual development did not just happen. We should be training for godliness. Verse 7 of chapter 4. Training means undergoing instruction and discipline. It takes effort, hard work, and commitment. Finally, because Timothy was younger than some of the false teachers, Paul wanted him not to allow his youthfulness to get in the way and to take charge of the situation in Ephesus by commanding them to stop teaching and correcting their doctrinal errors. Paul told Timothy to lead by example and be a model of what Christ expected from believers. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. And I wanted to quote another song. So this is a song from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Psalm number 956, verse 1. The words were modified by Percy Dever. He who would valiant be against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There is no discouragement shall make him once relent his first about intent. And that is to be a pilgrim. I love that song. Okay, we are going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 through 13. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your mercy that draws us to you and saves us from our sins. Amen. Help us not to cheapen what Jesus has done, but to be faithful to the end. Like Bunyan says, our first about intent to continue this pilgrim pathway all the way with no discouragement. We know discouragement does come, dear God. But help us to hold on to that first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. So as we study the path towards being disciplined Christians, we pray that you will inspire our hearts and help us to leave this place assured that your word has spoken to our hearts today. And may we continue to be pilgrims on this pathway, being the best pilgrims we can be, for Christ's sake. Amen. Commissioner Bill said something when we were talking about integrity a few weeks ago. We were looking at the Sermon on the Mount. I don't remember exactly which point, but the topic was integrity. That was the session that I put up and we took it down because they thought that it was inappropriate. Anyway, I want that back when the session was put back on YouTube. One of the things he said when we had our list, we had a list of the things that people with integrity do. That was over here. And over here we have a list of the things that they don't do. And what the thing he said was, people with integrity don't defend others. And I felt convicted. Thank you for that conviction. Ever since he said that, I thought, do I say things that defame others? If I claim to be a man with integrity, do I say things that defame others? It has been the best challenge I've had in the past. Don't be vain. That is a prelude or precursor to what I'm about to say. I want to focus on errors <coughs> in the modern church, but I don't want us to defame anyone in the process. Okay? Errors in the modern church. So I want you to think about errors in the modern church. On question number five, I say, what are obvious examples of unsound teaching? And how would you determine that a teaching is not sound? I call that errors in the modern church. And I want to start with something that is called the prosperity gospel. Also sometimes called name it and claim it. And I want to say that a lot of this you see in televangelism, this is how we would be aware of it because we are not in congregations or around people who are doing this a lot. If you come to the same place all the time, you're not going other places, so you're not aware except by the media. And usually it's through television that you would see a lot of this. First of all, I do not expect that everyone will like the session today because I do not intend to step on your toes, but I might step on your toes. But I'm asking your forgiveness, not your permission. Preaching that if you can get yourself in God's favor, 
that God will give you a personal blessing, especially if you write a personal check to God, a large one. God will bless that and multiply it. I know I've offended somebody today. I think the prosperity gospel is an error. There are many faithful Christians around the world who suffer, and they don't prosper materially. They hold on the first about an end to be a pilgrim, come what may. So I personally went on record as saying that I think the prosperity gospel is an error. I open the floor now. I was going to say, um, I speak to another version of the prosperity gospel, which is not so much about writing a check, but the idea that if you have enough faith, then you can keep bad things from happening to you or sticking with you. And I would say that that's an error because Jesus has already said that in this world we are going to suffer. And so, and he said in other parts of the Bible, if you're going to suffer, you're going to suffer for righteousness' sake or for Christ's sake as opposed to suffer for some, let's say, foolishness you choose you chose to do. And so this, it can get people really bound up because they think, well, I'm sick. And someone will say, well, you need more faith. But that sickness may be because that's just what the Lord has down, you know, for your situation right now. The name it and claim it, I say, is an error because it usurps a process that I think is very clear in the Bible, which is if you pray according to God's will. And name it and claim it says that I can now determine what it is I want, what I think. I will name it and then apply all this to the faith I have. And I can somehow force God's hand or force the Lord to do something that's not in his will for me. The corollary to that, which the other way you saw firsthand during our days in Africa, was that the more money you gave, the more God would bless you. That you could purchase blessing from the Lord by giving more money, usually to the one who was asking for the money. Uh, but if you gave more money, God would bless you more. Very sincere Christians who believe that the more money they gave, the more God would bless them. I think I wanted to mention in Joel on the second category, um, if you are in trouble, it's kind of a different flip it around. If you're in trouble, then you've done some sin. <laughs> you know, we saw, but that's an Old Testament one too, but you know. I put that in the context of out of context preaching. They will claim one verse and use that verse to tell you there's a principle or doctrine based on one verse, and you have to be very careful about doctrines based on one verse. Other contributions. I think one thing we need to be careful about. I agree with you that prosperity gospel is an error, but it does not excuse us from the rules that God has put from from the things that God has said about giving, yeah. tithing gifts to others that that um, they are the truth but and God says we'll be blessed because of it but it's not based solely on the fact that we're tithing and I don't know how quite to get it away from the prosperity gospel because God doesn't say give us a, a whole bunch of money give me more money than this he says give me this specific amount set this amount aside for me Everyone doesn't agree on the interpretation of that. Yeah. Uh, so often we think that uh, when we give, there'll be a financial blessing, yeah. not just a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there's yeah. error in that. And, and I don't know that this is taught, but I know it's something that I went through and had to, and the Holy Spirit really talked to me about, was questioning God why something was happening. Like, who, is, who am I that he should answer me? Really, you know, I, I I don't know scripture or anything that goes along with that, but I, I know that God has convicted me of that to not ask Him to explain why something is happening. Okay. Do you want me to add to this list? No, no there? I just have. Okay. I mean, I, because I, I don't I don't have any scripture to back it up, but I know that God has worked on me on that. I I'm not to ask God why is this happening to me. Or, or the people I love, but to just say, uh, to praise him, because everything is for his honor and glory, to work his, his plan. I was trying to figure out how to add your contribution to the list. Sometimes we approach God inappropriately. 
you have not been taught how. So in, in part of the idea of if you name it and claim it, you also are telling God, here's what I want from you and here's how I'm going to negotiate that contract or that exchange with you. But in general, how do we approach God? Questioning God, asking about his will versus our want, or Lord, I'm not happy with you. Younger Christians talk to God in a way that I find to be irreverent. But other people might consider what I do, or older than I am, irreverent too. Like for example, I hear people pray, and when they say God, rather dear God, I keep thinking, no, put dear in front of it. I tell my children, at the end of every sentence they have with me or every conversation, you need to hear the word dad. I know it's old fashioned. <laughs> it just makes me feel as though I know you're talking to me, and there's that connection. So when you say God in your prayer, I want to hear dear God, dear Father. I can tell you how everyone in this class who prays right now in prayers. I study your prayers. <laughs> as a general principle, modern errors. That we want the preacher to say nice things, and certain topics will not be addressed. We do not talk about sin and hell anymore. We don't talk about the cross as much, except to view the cross as this wonderful, wondrous place without the suffering, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, cost in everything. And Bonhoeffer's main point is, yes, you're in salvation, but the walk towards holiness is going to cost you, which is what Bunyan is saying, because of progress. Your first avowed intent, come what may, I'm going to scale this course. We are off the course occasionally, but we get drawn back on the course, because your first avowed intent this is still on the course. Your promise or the pledge you make to God is that you're going to be faithful. It's a marriage, so to speak. Things happen. But God forgives. Other error? Well, if you want to build up on that, then there's more than one way to that single God that's being, you know, that would be an add on to mm -hmm. expediency. It's like. I'm going to put universalism here. More than one way. To get to God. Christianity is one root, or even within Christianity, we can have so many different approaches, so everything here might be acceptable, and therefore you're so fed with it because if you want to grow your congregation, you don't do what I'm doing today. You don't step on people's toes because they'll vote with their feet. So you back off talking about certain things that would be controversial. Don't mention that because you know you don't want to offend. We're not preaching at some level the gospel is offensive. <laughs> it is to bring people into something that is valuable for this life and the afterlife. And it's okay for it to be offensive. And for us to say, I'm not ashamed. And the writer of this letter is the most avid apostle in going to tell people, even when he's in, in chains, he's preaching to the kings and the emperors and the governors and the whatever else. He's preaching to them. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The power of salvation for those who believe. Everybody, the whosoever will. The universal aspect of, of what Christ did for us, but also to recognize that there's one way. And the fact that people are saying there are all these ways, that's an error. But we want to get along. Sadly, I know family members who disagree with me. They've joined other branches of the church or maybe I disagree with them, <laughs> that I think have pulled them away from God. I don't want to be controversial. I'm just saying that there are many sources of error, and maybe some of what we do is error. Other people think it is, therefore we should be willing to look and see, well, is there error? And I'll quote a song that Bonnie likes, Arch Wiggins, If on my soul a trace of sin remain it. You want to get to the point where you say, Lord, if there's anything that's keeping me from being fully in your presence and fully committed, wash me till every part be clean. Because I want to live that others will see you in me. That's how tight the situation is. I told you you're here for two hours today, right? <laughs> so let me hit the high notes because I'm sure that some of you will leave in a few minutes. So I want to make sure that we leave with a sense of what the passage talks about. So I'm going to hit the high notes. So we talked about question number five, the obvious examples of unsound teaching. Question number one and two are easy to sort out. What, where is the false teaching grounded? And Paul talks about a doctrine of devils and deceiving spirits. That's a harsh comment. Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits taught by demons. 
He calls the teachings, the teachings of hypocritical liars who have no conscience. Do you know anyone who has a dead conscience? They will lie and not think about it? Yeah. A dead conscience. Someone who might allege to be a Christian and will say something that's wrong. They know it's wrong, but they're standing in the pulpit and say, anyway, dead conscience. Hypocritical liars, he calls them. That's what's happening. That's part of the area. Is in Ephesus right now, and Paul is saying, we've got to fix this. We've got to address this. And Timothy, I know you feel intimidated. Because these are older men who are leading the church there. But he says, here are the principles for good leadership. You go in and you fix it. You get rid of these guys. And Timothy is saying, I don't have the courage to do that. And Paul says, I believe in you. Go do it. And he writes him to encourage it. Says, okay, I understand these are older guys. Because in next week's chapter, he's going to say, now, here's how you deal with older men and widows. Here's the respect you show them. But you still have to tell them they're wrong when they're wrong. And now you are the divisional commander. You've got to go and say, you guys, what you're doing is wrong. The prosperity gospel that you're trying to teach, you got to stop it. That's not how we roll, <laughs> if I can use a modern expression. We don't do that. So here's the doctrine book. Here's what you focus on. In verses 11 and 12, question number 6, the challenge is facing Timothy. He said, don't let your youth be an obstacle. Timothy felt intimidated by these older people. The challenges that Timothy was facing included the fact that he was younger than most of these leaders and that he was sent in to challenge them and tell them to stop teaching error and he was feeling a little bit intimidated by the fact that I'm not the right man for this job. But Paul <laughs> believed in him. That's why Paul sent him. He was feeling a little discouraged, so Paul wrote to encourage him. And if you want to grow your congregation, you see your congregation isn't growing, and you see the other guys over there are using a different method, and their congregation is growing, you start thinking, well, maybe I should have what they're having. I should do what they're doing. Because I would like my congregation to grow. I would like God to bless my ministry. And how come God isn't blessing my ministry with numbers? So you do get that idea, okay, I've got to stop teaching this. The market experts will say, well, don't talk about sin. Or talk about things that will cause people to come in. The marketing experts, the churches in America that were built on marketing principles. Hmm. And they've grown to better churches. And they sell that plan to you. You want to grow your church? Here is the principle. There's one famous preacher, leader of this organization, who told people, join my association. Why should you spend 20 hours preparing a sermon? I will send you the sermon. Every week. The summary today. I wanted to talk about disciplines that make us good disciples. So let me just quickly read off what is on my master plan. Inward disciplines are prayer, the study of God's word. Some people fast, including fasting from TV or fasting from other practices that could get in their way. Then there are outward disciplines, which is service, simplifying your life, solitude. And then there are corporate disciplines, where we come together on Sunday for prayer, worship, Bible study, and praising God. But there are many disciplines that you should know that you practice. And the question is, what disciplines make us good disciples? And more applied, do you practice these disciplines so that you can improve your time with the Lord? In closing, I put one song that says, take time to be holy. Speak often with your Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forget it in nothing. This blessing. That's just one verse out of four. Take time to be holy. That's right. Your God, the call to walk the pilgrim pathway is often viewed as a hard path. And sometimes we get distracted. And sometimes we don't feel it going on, carrying on. But help us to abide with the principles that will keep us close to you. Coming to fellowship, setting aside time to pray, reflecting on who we are, and serving others. The simple principles can keep us doing what we ought to do for you. And we'll get a blessing from you. Keep us faithful, Lord. And may our hearts be filled as we think of what you did for us and may we do in the words of Sidney Edward Cox, go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary, how he's forgiven our sins and saved our soul and cleansed our hearts. So may we do the best we can as pilgrims this week. And may someone be blessed because of our ministry for Christ. Amen. Amen.